And tonight's um, discussion is going to be about globalization. So um, <clears throat> the merits and drawbacks of glo globalization are again being debated um, by our politicians. Uh, with the passing of the Bre Brexit vote and Donald Trump's America First doctrine, protectionist policies have become more prevalent, challenging globalization. So um, tonight our speaker is going to um, talk about that, how it will be affected by protectionist trade policies, how the United States and the world will be affected by these policy policies, and is globalization really at an end or in need of a refresh? So our speaker is David Curry. Um, he is a professor of humanistic studies and global studies and also co-director of the Center for Middle East Studies and Partnerships at the University um, of Wisconsin in Green Bay. Additionally, his one, he is one of the advisors of the International Business Minor. As an undergraduate, Professor Curry studied in Salzburg, Austria, and then later studied for almost two years at the University of Hamburg, Germany. He has published widely on contemporary German cinema, as well as the contemporary novel. Uh, more recently, he has been studying the intersection of Eastern and Western cultures as expressed in European literature and film. Of particular interest in the role globalization has played in shaping conceptions of identity, as well as the so-called clash of cultures and civilizations in Europe. An avid cinephile, he is also the director of the Green Bay Film Society and serves on the board of Film Green Bay. So let's all welcome Mr. Curry, and um, we'll get started. <clears throat> Great. Thank you very much for that very nice introduction. And can you all hear me okay? Yep. Great. Wonderful. Well, thanks for the invitation. I'm very thrilled to be here, um, and I appreciate the invitation to come down to Sheboygan this evening, and I appreciate that you all come out uh, on somewhat drizzly evenings. So um, tonight's topic, the end of globalization. Um, is one that I, I feel very strongly about. I teach a class on globalization, so I was very uh, excited to talk about this. And I thought that um, the first thing that's really important to do is talk about what exactly is globalization. There's not a lot of consensus as to what it means. And um, so I want to talk first to make sure that we all understand what some of the different ideas and definitions of globalization are. And then to also talk, of course, about some of the positives and negatives. What are the good things about globalization? What are some of the bad things about globalization? And then we'll raise the question, why might it be coming to an end? The topic for this that was suggested by the Foreign Policy Association is the end of globalization. So why might it be coming to an end? And then what might the future hold? Let's make some speculations there. And then, most importantly, that we'll have a chance to talk about it, discuss it, hear your thoughts, comments, and questions. So I want to make sure we leave plenty of time for that at the end. So the question about what exactly is globalization? Um, a lot of people say that globalization is really um, just a new term for something that's very old. So there has been this historical process of um, interchange from going back to trading back in the Middle Ages and afterwards of different cultures coming into contact with each other through ships trading and then of course in the late 19th century with trains and automobiles that um, not only bring different goods and services to other places, but you have an interaction of people and contact with other people and other cultures. Um, and that can be good and that can also of course lead to some um, conflicts. So in, it's a historical process that began with a lot of our human ancestors moving around and migrating across the globe. And then in the many thousands of years that followed that, um, a lot of those distances have been overcome, whereas people who originally had to go on foot and then on horse, then with things that um, accelerated and made contact and travel much more rapid. A lot of these distances and barriers for this kind of interaction and connection became overcome and this facilitated even more an exchange of goods and an exchange of ideas. And this exchange of goods and of ideas, the whole point of trade in many ways, was a desire to improve our lives, right? So that we can have better things, that we can be aided by technology in, of course, in the 19th and then in the 20th century that brought us um, easier lives. Machines, mechanization, automation has made our lives and jobs of workers easier and uh, improved the standard of living. So 
Globalization in many ways has a lot to do with interconnectedness and interdependence. And this has grown over time as our contact and our ability to interact and move across the globe um, has increased uh, as well. So Jeffrey Sachs, who is a um, very well-known economist, I believe at uh, Princeton University, has said that national economies have become integrated through globalization in four fundamental areas. The first being trade, what we were talking about um, before. The second being finance, banking and global financial institutions and markets. The third being production. And then the fourth are treaties and international institutions. And so these four things, he said, have really brought what used to be individual nation states more and more together through these processes of globalization. So I want to take a look at these four aspects that he talks about uh, a little bit more um, in depth to see what ex exact, exactly he's talking about. So trade, um, on the first one, since World War II, has grown actually more rapidly than global production. And some of you might have heard on the radio or, um, or in the reading in the newspapers, on television, that we've seen that we have a problem right now after the pandemic of supply chain, right? That there are these stories in, in Savannah, Georgia, and in Los Angeles that of cargo ships and these containers that are stacked up that we've got more things than we're able to actually move around. The trade has increased so much, but um, for a variety of reasons that are specific to the pandemic, have really caused a problem in, in getting these things um, moving around. We saw that with the pandemic as well. Suddenly there were shortages of things. Masks. Everybody here tonight is wearing masks. Thank you very much for that. But you remember a year ago, you couldn't find masks anywhere, right? They were all being made in China. China couldn't produce enough of them. Billions of people People around the world needed it, so we were reliant on things like those or respirators because of increased trade and the interconnectedness that we had for these a lot of these products. Second one is finance and global financial institutions. There's something in policy and in international finance called foreign direct investment, but we more commonly think of this as just foreign aid and the amount of money that the United States sends in aid to other countries. And this has also increased exponentially over the past 50 or 100 years. And the United States is very generous in giving a lot of money, developmental aid, financial aid, to um, other countries around the world, to what we call developing world countries. And there are a lot of institutions around the world that also help in promoting growth, promoting financial stability, and helping countries that have failed economies. You might have heard of the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund. Those are two global financial institutions that are, as their name implies, are, are global in scope and with the work that they do, right? That also contributes to the interconnectedness of national economies and of this process of globalization. Production. Falling transportation and communication costs have led to increase in production and, of course, increase in trade as well, right? So if we look probably um, at most of the things that we're wearing tonight, I'm going to go out on a limb and say more likely than not it was probably produced in China, or at least not in the United States, right? The United States used to produce a lot of things. We used to have a lot of mills and produce clothing and textiles and things like that. But through globalization, it has been offshored or outsourced, another word for that, because labor costs are cheaper, right? So we can buy things more cheaply when they're produced in other countries. And one of the pluses of globalization is that has brought jobs to poorer countries that didn't have those before and now can produce shoes, clothes, automobiles, masks, respirators, all of those types of things, which increases the standard of living in those countries and also provides cheaper goods for those of us in uh, wealthier and more developed countries. That's one, certainly one of the positives of globalization. So don't worry, I'll also talk about some of the negatives of globalization as we go along as well. But certainly trade, finance, production. And then the fourth one that Sachs talks about are international treaties. This is the harmonization of trade. So there's another organization called the World Trade Organization, the WTO, which is an international global organization. And what it does is it tries to ensure that all countries 
countries are playing by the same rules, that they're playing fairly when it comes to trade, that they don't put a lot of protectionist tariffs on their goods, that they aren't discriminating against goods or services from another country to try to create a level playing field. Um, the economic institutions that I talked about as well, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, but very important now are also international treaties dealing with climate change, right? There has been the Kyoto Accords back in the 1990s, the Paris Accords more recently, that are trying to get all of the countries in the world to come together to tackle the problem of climate change on a global scale. Because one country can't do it alone, because we all share the same water, the same air, and it has to be coordinated and done on a global scale. So globalization then has enabled these types of organizations to come together through international treaties and international institutions to try to work together. Another one of the positives of um, globalization. So another definition of globalization is that globalization is the acceleration and intensification of interaction and integration among the people, companies, and governments of different nations. So I like this definition because it's very concise and it touches on a lot of different things. So we might ask, why acceleration and why intensification? Okay. So one, one, acceleration, we talked about things like, well, sh ship transportation and then trains and cars, but now airplanes, right? We can fly around the world from here down to Chicago and you can fly almost anywhere in the world from a major airport like uh, Chicago. Um, intensification, I have my cell phone right here and I could send an email or a text to somebody on the other side of the globe and they'll get it within seconds. Okay? This was unthinkable 100 years ago. Okay? And so one of the tables that I like to show about this, just particularly for my, my students who are all you know, 17, 18 years old and don't know a world that existed without computers or cell phones because that is their entire world, that you can go back and look at the cost of a three minute telephone call from New York to London. In 1960, these are in adjusted dollars, what it would cost in 2000, would have cost $60 for a three minute phone call. Right? Now you can do it for free, right? You can get on FaceTime or Zoom or Skype and it doesn't cost you anything. So I mean, imagine in 1960 telling people, you know, 50, 60 years from now, this is gonna be free, where they are paying $60 for that. And then it gradually went down. To in the year 2000, it only cost 40 cents. As I say, now it doesn't cost anything. If you have internet, you can come to your public library, call anybody in the world, and it won't cost you a penny. The price of a computer with its equipment and things, again, adjusted for inflation, GDP, and all of that kind of stuff. In the 1960s, it would have cost almost $2,000, right? I'm sorry. A million dollars. I got to look at that. A million dollars. Right? This is when computers, they were the size of this room and were able to do basic addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, right? Some of you might actually remember those early days of calculators, these big things, and all well, they could do at the beginning was add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And then over the years, the price came down so that now you can have a really great computer like this one right here for a few hundred dollars, right? So from a million dollars down to a couple hundred dollars and all of the things you can do with that. This is also one of the products of globalization, but has contributed to this acceleration and intensification of interaction that we have with peoples around the globe. So what are the impacts then of all this bid? Right? Has it been good or has it been bad? Well, the increasing integration of the world or globalization has certainly enriched lives of all of us. Right? I think that's without a doubt. I was just talking, the fact that you can call, um, my son actually is in Spain right now, and we text all the time, and you know, years ago that would have been 30 or 40 dollars to call, but now I can do it for free on the internet. It's brought cheaper products that have raised the middle class up to be able to purchase things, to be able to travel. So lots of things have really been um, beneficial and enriched our lives as a result of globalization. Um, so for many people looking at globalization, it's the only way for the future. By continued globalization um, is necessary to tackle things like climate change. Certainly when the, the pandemic hit, I think we all realized this is a global problem. It cannot be solved by one country. Australia tried to do that. They said, we're going to shut down our borders, we're not going to allow anybody in, and we're going to defeat the virus just by closing down. And it didn't work. You know why it didn't work? 
for that. And it wasn't, they, they still had cases of COVID, even though they were down to like zero. Sorry, and what happened was that they found out was that they still needed things, right? They can't, you can't live entirely on an island. island. So they were flying in goods from Southeast Asia. And the pilots then, who were going in a taxi to spend the night in a hotel before flying the cargo planes back, they brought in the virus. So they didn't allow anybody in, and they had shut it down, but they still weren't able to do that, right? Because they couldn't be entirely self-sufficient. So it's not possible on your own. It has to be a global problem. But for many others, they look at globalization and say, well, this is really also a curse. Right? There are a lot of negatives that come along with this. And it's really important here that we think not only about wealthy, developed world countries, but we also have to think about the developing world, what we used to call the third world. Right? We used to talk about first, second, and third world. Then when the Soviet Union collapsed, which was the second world, the terminology has changed to developed and developing world. So we are in the wealthy, developed world. But the developing world is impacted greatly by globalization um, as well. And this has led to certain pushbacks against a lot of things about globalization that other countries, or even some of us in the United States, think is not good and is negative. So I'd like to move on now and talk about what are some of these pros and cons? What are some of the more specific things that are good about globalization or some of the problems that globalization has brought? Politically and culturally, there are lots of studies about these. And, um, and facts that have been ascertained as a result of globalization. And it's been shown through a variety of studies that the more globalized the country is, the greater the spread of democracy and freedom. Right? So becoming more globalized, having more open borders has resulted in democracy and freedom. This was actually one of, um, when you don't have 17 or 18 year old students in front of you, you have some people that have more life experience and might remember when President Nixon and Henry Kissinger opened up China. This was exactly the goal, right? If you engage with China, it will eventually lead to greater freedoms and greater democracy. China's not there yet, but it without a doubt did that. Whatever you think about Richard Nixon, Henry Kissinger, and that policy, the opening up of China and making contact with them led to increased freedoms, democracy, and an increase in the, in the middle class in China. It also leads to free trade, and free trade brings wealth, prosperity, jobs, and opportunities. Right? So of course, there's always a flip side of that. When I talked about outsourcing and those mills in, used to be in North Carolina that made a lot of textiles, when they were outsourced either to Mexico or to China, all of those people lost their jobs. But it created jobs in other countries that were poorer and helped lift up those countries out of poverty to bring opportunities, jobs, wealth, and so forth to other countries. The negative side are those here who lost their jobs, had to retrain and find some sort of uh, a job somewhere else. The spread of ideas and information promotes opportunities, but also freedom and human rights. The internet is a wonderful thing and also a terrible thing, right? But one of the great things about it is that it has brought about the spread of freedom and human rights. The Arab Spring, some of you might remember from about 10 years ago, started in Tunisia, moved on to Egypt and so forth. That was one of the first revolutions that was really driven by social media. So people were using Facebook, they were using texting um, in order to gather and protest. And through that type of information that was only available by the, the advent of the internet, they were able then to come together and result in change, in a regime change in Egypt. It also brings, quite simply, the enrichment of human life, right? Sharing of cultures, new food, new customs, new ideas. So our lives are enriched by our interaction, our contact with other people who bring new ideas, who bring new food, new customs, new things that we can learn from, and it expands our horizons. A few more things, a few more statistics about the positives of globalization. It's been shown that the more globalized a country is, the more it spends on public education. The more it enjoys political rights and freedom. The more globalized the country is, the less corruption it has in its country and its government. And the more globalized the country is, the more open its borders are. Right? So having open borders, free trade, leads to things like 
more spending on public education, greater f rights and freedoms, less corruption. But some people will say, well, open borders is going, particularly in this day and age, is going to lead to increased crime or terrorism. However, there have been studies that have shown that having open borders and being more globalized does not necessarily lead to higher degrees of terrorism. So there's not a direct correlation between open borders and increased terrorism. So now, which countries are the most globalized? Anybody have any idea? I want to guess what country in the world. There's, of course, there's an organization for everything. And there's an organization that studies this through all kinds of statistics and charts. And they come up with what are the most globalized countries in the world. Anyone want to guess? Yeah. Finland. Finland. Good guess. Anyone else? Denmark. Denmark. Also up there at the top. It's actually Ireland of all places. But a lot of the Scandinavian countries, as you mentioned, Denmark is on there, and Finland is also on there. They're certainly in the top 10 uh, amongst those. But a lot of countries in Northern Europe, Scandinavian countries that have these strong social democracies, Singapore, um, Hungary, and Canada, and the Czech Republic are also there as well. So, so those are certainly the positives, right? Uh, the good things that we know about globalization. But what are some of the negatives? Because there's always two sides to a coin, right? And one of the negatives and one of the fears that people have had for many years about globalization, particularly on the cultural level, is that it will lead to sameness, right? And that it will lead to uniformity and the loss of cultural specificity. When everybody starts moving around in immigration, you can fly there, here or there then everything will become kind of the same. This was one of the biggest concerns about the European Union, that it would create what people called a Euro pudding, right? That Spain and Italy would lose its distinctiveness and would all become kind of bland and the same. You dump everything into a pot, boil it, and stir it, and then it's just not as good. Right? And the term that many people have used for that is the McDonaldization of the world, right? That it all becomes sort of fast food, fast cars, fast-paced life, right? And in particular, and here's where I want you to think about other countries outside of the United States, that their concern is that the spread of American-style capitalism, the spread of fast food and of American products will then slowly erode their own culture, right? And um, that this is the conquest of American-style capitalism. So we're exporting everything about the United States and saying all the world should be like us because we've been successful, we're wealthy, and we have a lot of wonderful things here. Right? So a lot of people, a lot of people who study globalization will say that in many ways globalization is really a westernization of the world. It's the imposition of Western ideas on the rest of the world. And some people will go so far as to say it's really the Americanization of the world. That America is the driving force of the West. Westernization is equated with uh, Americanization, and it's spreading around the world. And you can see that even just very basically. When you look at photos around the world, how many times do you see young people wearing jeans, t-shirts, and tennis shoes? Anywhere you go in the world, right? Coca-Cola. Anywhere you go in the world, you can find Coca-Cola. Everybody knows what it is. And where did that come from? Where did Levi Strauss start? Where did Coca-Cola start? It started in the United States, and it spread all around the world, right? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? If you work for Coca-Cola, that's a good thing. If you work for Levi Strauss or Nike, that's a great thing. If you work for a small beverage company in Nigeria, maybe it's not a good thing because Coca-Cola is putting you out of business, right? So it's all a matter of perspective on a lot of these. Another criticism that a lot of people have is they say that globalization is a kind of dictatorship of unelected officials who then impose a lot of these rules. So it is true. The World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the World Trade Organization have a lot of power. Right? The United Nations also has a lot of power. But did you vote for any of these people? I didn't. Right? So how did they get there? Well, they were appointed by governments. Right? We voted for um, whoever our president is. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't, but a lot of people voted for them. And that government then appoints these representatives to these different organizations. But other people, particularly outside of the United States, will say, you know, they're telling us how we have to run our country. But I didn't vote for these. And not surprisingly, the United States overwhelmingly has a lot of power 
<clears throat> in the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Trade Organization. And the majority of the people on those boards are from the United States because the United States gives the most money to those organizations. So we also have a vested interest in that. But other people were saying, well, you tell me that we can't have a nationalized airline or a nationalized corn industry because that goes against free trade rules because the World Trade Organization says so. Well, I don't agree, but those are sort of the new global rules. So again, it depends on your perspective, whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. So what is the fear of this? The fear is the imposition of values and economic principles onto other from the wealthiest nations in the world on some of the poorer ones, right? That in order to be successful, you need to do things the way we did things, right? That's sort of the argument. Maybe it's right, maybe it's not, but every country is a little bit different, and the American model or the Western model may not be the best one for them. And the fear is that the rich will only get richer and the poor will get poorer, right? So that's one of the negatives that people see about this. And there's also a concern about loss of tradition and loss of local institutions, right? With powerful multinational corporations, they can come in and have a lot more power that can put smaller businesses, smaller craftspeople, um, and these local traditions uh, sort of out of business there. And some people view that as a type of economic colonialization, right? That is American, Western-style economics that are coming in and sort of maybe destroying the local economy there. So the fear here, another example of this. How many countries are there in the world? Anyone know, roughly? Recognized countries? Pardon? 300. 300? A little bit less. There are 195 countries in the world. How many countries in the world do you think have a McDonald's? Every one of them. <laughs> North Korea doesn't, and Iran doesn't either. But the number goes up and down, but it's 120. Okay? So there are 195 official countries in the world recognized by the United Nations, and 120 of those have a McDonald's. <laughs> the other ones have Starbucks. Now, is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? Well, again, it all depends. And that's one of the things that I always want to tell students when I teach globalization. It's not all good and it's not all bad. It all depends on your perspective. Right? I remember I had a Polish student. This was many years ago, maybe 15, 20 years ago. Uh, an international student in my class, and we were talking about this very fact. And my students were like, yeah, that's awful, you know, that McDonald's is the worst kind of food, fast food, greasy, and we're exporting that to everybody else. And it's the worst of American culture, and there's so many things that are better than that, but yet this is the image that people have. And she raised her hand because Poland, as you know, up until 1990 was a communist Soviet satellite. And she said, my friends and I were thrilled when the first McDonald's opened in Poland because we thought we've joined the rest of the world. This is great. We have something from the United States. And my students were like, oh my gosh, I never thought about that. Right? For her, this was something that Poland was joining the world community because it had a McDonald's. Right? Now, maybe they may not think that, but at the time, it represents a kind of status symbol, right? You've reached this, this global economy. I don't recommend eating hamburgers all the time, but you know, there's, there's something to be said about that. So I talk a lot about McDonald's, not to be negative about McDonald's, but because it's a really good example to talk about globalization. Thomas Friedman, who is a columnist for the New York Times, wrote some years ago in a book about globalization that the more McDonald's two countries have, the less likely they are to go to war. That's a strange statement, right? <laughs> Let's go. Let's more McDonald's, right? So the question is why? Why would there be a correlation to having more McDonald's and being less likely to go to war? The reason is because they're more globalized, they're more economically interdependent, relying on other countries, and therefore they're more likely to find peaceful means of resolution to maintaining those economic trade relationships. Right? So the more McDonald's they have, the more globalized they are, the more interdependent they are, and the less likely they are to solve conflicts via war. Right? In 2008, when there was the big financial crisis, you remember that, the big downturn, the great recession, Slate magazine, an online magazine, found another statistic related to this, and they said the more Starbucks a country has, the bigger its financial problems were during the great recession of 2008. Why would that be the case? 
Because the more Starbucks a country had, the more globalized it was, the more interrelated its financial institutions were, and this was a domino effect. Remember, in 2008, that one country was, you know, the subprime mortgages and all of these, you know, toxic assets that were being bought and sold on Wall Street, and it had this domino effect. And all of the other countries that were linked financially through globalization got hit by that. If they were very globalized, and if they were very globalized, they had a lot of McDonald's, or Starbucks, and McDonald's, probably both. Okay? So this idea of McWorld as being um, a symbol of globalization is something, there was a political scientist at the University of Maryland who wrote a book called Jihad versus McWorld. And this was before 9-11. He wrote it in the 1990s. And what he meant by jihad was not what we think of now as holy war from you know, radicalized people in, um, in political Islam, but pushing back against McWorld. And so McWorld he defined as the Americanization of the world through consumer-oriented market capitalism. And jihad he defined as the resistance to this, sort of the pushback that other countries had, saying, this is not what we want, right? We are, don't want American-style, consumer-oriented things. We want to have our own culture, our own way of doing things, which could be quite different, but nevertheless, um, our own sorts of economic um, systems. So this push and pull has led to a number of tensions within globalization. So there's another very short article that I always like to teach with my students that talks about the three tensions of um, globalization. And I just want to outline this here. And I think you'll really get then a, a sense of that and then leading to why we might talk about the end of globalization in relationship to these um, uh, three tensions. Um, so first of all, before we got there, I thought that was the slide, that is globalization political, economic, and cultural integration, or is it the westernization or Americanization of the world, right? So positive or negative. Is it a force for economic growth and the spread of democracy, or is it the exploitation of the West of the underdeveloped world? That is using cheap labor in um, poorer countries, and you've, we've all read these horrible stories about countries that go and produce you know, shoes and they pay people you know, a dollar a day and then sell them back to the United States for $150 or something like that, right? So there are two sides to all of these. And we can see these in many ways in these three tensions. So the first tension that um, the author of this, this article talks about is individual choice versus societal choice. Okay? Can you think of any examples there of this tension between individual choice and societal choice? This might be one these days, right? Masks. This is a big debate now about do I wear a mask? Is it my choice or is it doing something for society? A few years back, this was a big debate about smoking. Remember when more and more uh, cities and, and counties were banning smoking, first in restaurants and bars, and people were saying, I have a right to this, and I, you know, if I want to smoke, I have a right to this, and other people were saying, well, secondhand smoke, all of these causes and all of the negatives about smoking is about society. Right? But it's a tension, right? What about my individual rights versus what's better for society? Sadly, the pandemic has really exacerbated that. Yeah? Um, Seatbelts. Seatbelts is another one. Yep. Mm -hmm. When that law came in in the 1970s, people were like, you know, who's the government to tell me that I have to wear a seatbelt and blah, blah, blah. My choice versus societal choice. Okay? Abortion be one? Abortion as well, right? My body, my choice, versus the government saying I can or can't do that. Mm -hmm. That's another one as well that's there. So a second one, free market versus government intervention or subsidies, right? So Adam Smith, some of you might remember that, his, that name, and the free hand of the market, right? That the uh, free market will regulate everything, and the government's role is sort of to step back and let the market do its thing. Or should government be involved in regulating things in order to create a level playing field, right? And this often comes up with subsidies. And the United States is as guilty as this of any other country. We, we slap tariffs. I think now, you know, we got into some tiff with France and we put a, a tax on French wine and then France put a tax on American bourbon. Some years ago, President Bush put a, a tariff on steel coming in in order to boost American steel production. And it's a way, of course, of you know, trying to 
improve local industries, right? But it can be used punitively to punish other countries about things, or it can be used to try to boost um, our own industries, right? A lot of countries have a nationalized airline, right? So I tell students, you know, a small country like Lithuania, right? If they had to work on free market principles, they might not have an airport or a national airline because there's not enough people who want to fly to Lithuania. So the government says, well, it's important for our people to be able to fly to places. So we're going to subsidize and we're going to have a nationalized airline that the government funds. Then Delta and British Airways say, well, that's not fair because the government's supporting them. They're making a lot of losses and we don't get bailed out from the government, etc. Right? So this is one of those tensions, free market versus government intervention. And then the third is local authority versus sort of supranational authority. We see this tension all the time in the United States, right, between states' rights and the federal government, right? People say states' rights, the state needs to do whatever, whatever it wants to do, and the, in Washington should stay out of it because they're, uh, you know, all the way over there on the East Coast. You see the same thing in Europe about Brussels. Tell, you know, countries in Europe saying, you know, Brussels shouldn't tell us here in Spain or in Italy what we want to do or what we have to do. We need to have our own local control. And then you get in a more broader picture and look at things like the United Nations. A lot of people say, ah, oh, we should get out of the United Nations. Who are them? They to tell us what we have to do, local control, et cetera, right? So that's another tension that comes along with um, globalization. So all three of these play out on a very local level, but they also play out on a broader, more international or globalized level. Culturally, um, globalization can promise an international civil society that leads to a new era of peace and democracy that we talked about. For others, as we said, there's a negative side to this. And um, it's the concern over the dominance of the American system of westernization and of so-called McWorld. Right? So a few more things about globalization for you to think about, pros and cons, and then we'll talk about why maybe um, we might, some people might think that globalization is, is slowing down or coming to an end. I'm sure you know, all know this old adage, right? That give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. This is also related to globalization in many ways. Outsourcing, tr international trade, and the ability to lift up other countries to have an increased standard of living. So since globalization has emerged in the 1970s, we've seen that world infant mortality rates have fallen by half, right? Expanded healthcare and medicine around the world has led to a, a dramatic decrease in infant mortality rates. Adult literacy has increased by a third as a result of a lot of these processes of globalization. Primary school uh, enrollment has arisen has risen, and the average lifespan has shot up by almost 11 years around the world. Okay? So undoubtedly, there's a lot of pros from uh, a lot of good things about globalization. Economically, growth and globalization is responsible for reducing poverty around the world. And studies have shown that developing countries with open economies grew by approximately 5% a year in the 1970s and the 1980s, while those with closed economies had a decline in growth and gross national product. Right? So this idea of having open borders, free trade, leads to economic prosperity, leads to economic growth, and having closed societies like North Korea or like Iran or um, now Myanmar, those countries are seeing economic collapse. Afghanistan right now is on the, also on the verge of an economic collapse as a result of this as well. Right? So open economies, open societies lead to wealth, growth, and prosperity. Right? Today, 24 of the developing countries, that is the former third world, who have about 3 billion people, have adopted policies that allow their citizens to take advantage of globalization. What has the result of that been? Their economies are catching up with those. I mean, just look at China over the past 50 years, and you can see that. Um, the increase in Mexico's economy, or of Vietnam, right? I mean, there are a lot of things now as an industrial nation has really um, caught up quite a bit. And the economies of the least globalized countries, Iran, Pakistan, North Korea, have dropped or remained stagnant. But there's the question of the winners and losers. So why now? Getting to the final point before our discussion, why is there this pushback and why do people say 
globalization is not a good thing, right? This is not brought all that it's been cracked up to be. Well, who are the winners and losers when we look at this? Taking a look at the United States, the real median hourly wage in the United States in 1973, adjusted to $2,000, was $12.45. Okay? So if you adjusted it to $2,000. In 2012, it was $12.90. Okay? So you've seen that over the course of 50 years, in real dollars, there has not been any increase in the real median hourly wage in the United States. So a lot of people, particularly the working class, the working poor, are saying, what have I gotten out of globalization? Right? What has this brought me? During that same time, however, the US economy grew by 72%. Right? But the hourly median wage did not. So there are a lot of people, in, particularly in the former Rust Belt, in rural areas, that look at this and say, uh-uh. This has not brought anything for me. Right? All it's doing is it's shipping jobs overseas. We're sending billions of dollars to other country in aid. But what am I getting out of this? Right? So since the median is, by definition, the middle wage ladder, the losers in many cases in the United States have been a lot of employees, workers, right? the working class. And here's a, um, a graphic that shows this uh, a little bit better. And it's showing that American paychecks are bigger than 40 years ago, but their purchasing power hasn't really changed since 1964 right, to 2018. So the green line shows uh, purchasing power, something called PPP, purchasing power parity, when you adjust for inflation and everything. Although if you look at the actual wages, but because of inflation and all of these other things, there hasn't really been a budge in 50 years from this. Right? So you can see now why people are a lot some people, not everybody, but a certain group of people, not only in the United States, but in other countries, are saying, this isn't working. Right? Globalization is not working for me. It might be working for those people, but it's not really bringing much for me. So some of the negatives about this as well, that in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, it was quite common for people, a typical wage earner, one person instead of uh, husband and wife both, to buy a house, support a family, and put their kids through college on one income. I can guarantee you that is impossible now, unless you're super wealthy. I know, because I have <laughs> two kids in college, and my wife and I are both working, and we can't wait till payday comes for that, right? So is that still possible? For some people, yeah, but for a lot of people, it's not, right? So you look back and you say, well, Things were better, things, we were less globalized then, but things economically were perhaps a little bit better. Um, so are countries and politicians then sort of souring on globalization and saying, well, you know, maybe this isn't um, all it's cracked up to be? And perhaps might it signal the end of globalization? And I would suggest there are two trends that have exemplified this push then pushback towards, against globalization. One is a form of populism, or what I'll call Trumpism. I don't mean President Trump as an individual, but I mean his policies, his economic policies of isolationism and nationalism, right? Or what he referred to as America first, right? We're gonna focus on things here, we're gonna build our own industries, not import things, we're gonna get out of all these trade deals. NAFTA, remember he said, the worst trade deal in the world, right? TPP, the Trans-Pacific, worst trade deal, since NAFTA, we're not going to be in that either. We're going to end the nuclear agreement with Iran. We're not going to ratify the Paris Accord, right? We're going to concentrate on what's best for the United States, right? And that means getting out of all of these treaties, cutting down, ending all of these wars, bringing everybody back, not sending money to all of these organizations. He wanted out of the United Nations, didn't want in the World Trade Organization anymore, the IMF, all of those things. Get rid of it and we'll focus on the United States. And a lot of other countries are saying, yeah, what he's saying, that's what we want to do too, right? And who was the first country to do that? England, Brexit. They said, we're done with the European Union, right? We don't want to send money to Brussels for them to send more money to these poorer countries. We want to focus on Britain first, right? We want to control our own borders. We want to take all that money that we were sending to Brussels and we're going to invest it in the National Health Service which turned out not to be true, and was the downfall of Nigel Farage, one of the, the people who made that big claim. But a lot of people bought it and said, yeah, why are we sending that money to Brussels that they then just send off to Poland and Bulgaria when our National Health Service is struggling here, right? So stop, let's get out and end it. And they did. 
Anybody looked how things are going in Britain these days? Not so good, right? They've had a lot. They actually, just this past week, they said they want to renegotiate some of the terms of Brexit because they've got some problems with it. Now, that doesn't mean that everything was wrong. And a lot of those people that had those complaints, they were right. So the question is, was the real problem globalization or was it how globalization was managed for them, right? So are we, or are they, throwing the baby out with the bathwater? So some of these things, Trumpism, as I call it, and populism, how does it sort of manifest it? It's manifested in being anti-elite, right? There are these elites, people like me, university professors, bad people, right, that are spouting all of this stuff that are, that's not good and is not helping the United States. We want America first, right? Close down our borders, stop all of this trade, reshore a lot of industries, bring back you know, he was going to bring back coal as well, right? That was one of the promises to West Virginia and Kentucky, where coal is still a big um, employer for people there. And he was going to bring back, you know, the automobile industry, the steel industry, the textile industry. All this stuff was going to come back to the United States. Production, industry, create jobs, prosperity, and everything, rather than having it shipped overseas. Choice and individualism, right? We can make this choice rather than having to be in multilateral agreements with other people around the world. And think back now about the three tensions, right? Individual choice versus societal choice, free market economy versus protectionist economy, and then local control versus supranational or international kinds of organizations. And that's what uh, populism and Trumpism were sort of pushing back and rejecting. And you see this populist rise all across Europe, the same type of things and the same type of governments. And what is one of the things that people say about that? The people who vote for Brexit and vote for populists are saying, this is only benefiting the wealthy, right? The richer are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. And here's an example in the United States. I mean, it is a fact. But again, the question is, is the problem globalization or is it how globalization is managed? and how it's been implemented in various countries, right? But this is um, from the data from the Congressional Budget Office over uh, household income of various percentages of people. It's flatlined for everybody below the top 1% since 1979. Another thing which I think is fascinating that shows that you know, we have a lot of polarization in this country, but when you really get down to the heart of it about what people really want and what they really think, they want a sense of fairness. How, how we get there, I think we're still miles apart. But this was a fascinating study done by two people at Harvard Business School and Duke University. And they ask people, what um, do they think the wealth distribution in the United States is? And that's the middle line. Right? So they think that the top 20% owns about 60% of the, world, of the wealth in the United States, when in fact it's over 80%. But then they were also asked, what do you think would be fair? What should it be? And there was this real sense of fairness at the bottom. The bottom graph is what Americans think the wealth distribution should be in an ideal world. The middle one is what they think it currently is, that it's not fair. The top one is what it actually is. See? So there is this sense of a desire for fairness and a sense that it's not happening through the system that we have now. And that is a system of globalization. Right? Brexit, same types of things, right? There was this anti-EU sentiment, right? That England is different. It's an island nation. It's not really part of the European Union. It didn't work. We want to divorce. We don't want to be in the European Union anymore, right? They wanted to control their own borders, um, which was a little bit problematic. If you want, we can talk about why that was problematic, but it was sold to them that way. I mean, they were, were, they were never part of a different agreement called the Schengen Agreement in the European Union. So they did have a lot of control of their own borders to begin with. But the perception was they didn't, and they wanted more control. They wanted, again, Britain first, right? This NHS funding, the national health system, with, which Brits are very proud of. They have a nationalized, socialized health care system, and they thought, bringing this money back from Brussels would go into the national health system and then boost it up. It didn't happen because they were also getting a lot of money from the European Union for a lot of things. And a lot of the money that they weren't paying in had to replace the money that they were getting from the European Union. So it was a two-way street in many cases. But 
Then finally, autonomy, more autonomy. We want more control. So think again about those three tensions, right? Individual choice versus societal choice. Local control over the European Union telling us what the rules and regulations have to be. And so they wanted out. What they're finding now is they have a lot of problems, right? One of the biggest problems, anybody know what the, one of the biggest problems that England has had in the past couple of weeks? Gasoline. Gasoline. And why? But there's not a shortage of gasoline. No, there's no truck. No truck drivers. Exactly. On my drive down here from Green Bay, there was a story on NPR about exactly that. The United States has the same problem, mm -hmm. that they can't get, there was a guy in Louisiana that said he runs a truck driving school, teaching people how to drive trucks. He said, I could double my class, and every single one of them would get a job tomorrow making sixty dollars to $80,000 a year. He said, I can't get enough people to do this. Right? Every, I don't know how it is in Sheboygan, but in Green Bay, every single store has signs, help wanted. Right? And England has that problem to really exacerbate it. And part of that has to do with immigration. Right? When you shut down, the pandemic has closed down travel and borders. And a lot of the people that were driving those trucks in England were immigrants or people that were driving back and forth on ships from mainland Europe on to, uh, to, to Great Britain. And that stopped, and there's simply not enough people there. Right? We've also shut down our borders. We haven't had a lot of immigration because of the pandemic. And we have a decrease population, right? Our population growth in the state of Wisconsin, you can look how many kids are there in elementary school, you can predict how many people are going to be graduating. Ten years from now, how many people are going to go to the university? I can tell you because our administration has been giving us these numbers for the past 15 years, and it's going like this. And if it's going like that, you still need people to do things. And if people aren't having babies, you've got to have people immigrating. The pandemic has really made it worse. Cracked down on immigration, exacerbated that even before, and now we've got this problem that there's just simply not enough people for all of the jobs that are available now that the economy is turning around again. So looking forward, this is my final slide. I talked a little bit longer than I wanted to. I apologize for that. But I, I always try to emphasize to students that globalization isn't all good and it's not all bad. There are a lot of things, undeniably that are good and important about globalization, but there are also a lot of things that are bad about, or problematic about globalization. Both of them are the case. So we have to try and find a middle ground. And it's also a fact. You can't really be for or against globalization because we've already crossed that bridge. You know, the internet's not going away, air travel's not going away, trade, all of this stuff is not, you can't just say we're against it and thanks, we're going back to the way it was in the 1900s. That's not going to happen, right? So the question is, how is it managed? How is it managed so that it's fair, both vertically and horizontally, around the world, but also within our own society? Those statistics that I showed you, it is true. The, richer are, the rich are getting richer, and the poor are getting stagnant. Right? That's not because there's not wealth there, but because of how it's managed. And it's not equitable vertically in the United States or horizontally around the world. So how is it managed? Who benefits and who loses from this? And that we have to consider the implications in the United States but also around the world for the developed world as well as for the developing world. Are there any bright spots? I always hate to leave things on a down note and a negative. There's, there's some glimmer of hope and, and things of positive about that. In my opinion, I think the global COVID response, I mean, we're still struggling and we've got a lot of work to do in the United States, but this was a time when the world came together and said, we have to find a way to do this. You can criticize a lot of the pharmaceutical companies and it's justifiable, but they are doing a lot of right things, right? They are trying to make cheaper vaccines. The United States has spent billions of dollars producing this and are giving it away to people or to other countries around the world. Everybody in the United States who wanted a vaccine, and I hope everybody got one, got it for free. In my university, you could get tested. In fact, I, last year, I had to be tested every two weeks to be on campus, right? I got a vaccine for free. I was tested for free. And this type of thing is going on around the world as well. So the world came together to try to solve a really global problem. Climate change. We have not done nearly enough but at least the world realizes this is a global problem and it has to be addressed together globally with a sense of cooperation. The United States has to get on board to the Paris Accords and has to do things to move much, much faster. Talk to my students. Talk to kids who are 17, 18 years old. Their number one concern, 
climate change and what their world is going to look like and what their children's world is going to look like 40 or 50 years from now. They get it and it's really, really important to them. And I can tell you because I talk to students all the time and you ask them, are you worried about climate change? And they say yes. In fact, in Germany, they just had elections two years ago, or two weeks ago. The number one topic when they polled people in Germany, what's your number one concern? It was not immigration. It was not COVID. It was not the economy. Their number one concern was climate change. And they voted based on that. And the Green Party had huge gains. And the conservative party that was in power lost because they did not have an aggressive enough climate uh, policy. So it is something that the world is working on and it recognizes that. This populist wave of sort of nativist kinds of ideas, Brexit, isolationism, economic nationalism is a little bit on the wane. There are some signs in Europe and around that, that that boom for a while when people thought a lot of these populist leaders that the European Union was going to collapse, a lot of these global things were going to um, go away. England is seeing the negative results of that. And I think some other countries that were thinking maybe we want to try the same thing are now having second thoughts when they're looking at how it's going in Britain and it's not going too well for them. And they're thinking, well, maybe things aren't so bad. We just need to work harder to improve it and have things work better for us rather than bailing out um, all the way. So this idea of being better together is something that's slowly coming around in the sense of a need for um, greater cooperation. But that's not to say there are a lot of challenges um, left ahead. So thank you. As I said, I talked a little bit too long, longer than I wanted to. But thanks for listening and your patience. And now I would love to hear your thoughts and questions, comments, ideas um, that anyone has. Yes? Um, my sister wanted to go to Europe, and we had to call my brother-in-law in Norway to see if we could get to a country that didn't have McDonald's and all that garbage. And he sent us to Poland. To uh, Poland? Uh -huh. Poland. So we got to Poland. We got an, an uh, apartment. And we were in a big building, and uh, the soldiers still had big, long, like really big guns. Everybody wore black. Nobody smiled, and my sister likes to spin. <laughs> and you would, you could go into the store. Nobody would look up. Nobody would look up at you. And you could stand there to give them money, and they're not looking at you. Yeah. It was amazing. It was just amazing that they hadn't learned that. Still a legacy of the 40 years under um, communist rule and uh, as a Soviet satellite. Yes. That, uh, yes. yeah. And number two, the, the last guy that was here, mm -hmm. he said, you are just wild. <laughs> <laughs> you are going to be so much. So, um, yeah, I know Dan very well, so he's a, he's a great guy. <laughs> Toilets, $12.10. Still. Yeah. And you said back in the 60s? Mm hmm. It was 70s? in adjusted to, to, to today's dollars. That was the so same. How do we jump back? Yeah, well, that, that's a great question. What to do? I can say that um, as a result of the pandemic, Wages are going up, so he can certainly earn more than that. I have a student whose boyfriend is earning $20 an hour at Chipotle, mm -hmm. that I was shocked. And in Green Bay, there are signs that at you know, Dick's Sporting Goods, Targets, that they're starting $17, $18 an hour. So it is going up. And that is another, you know, again, Trumpism, and not President Trump himself, but the idea about that was if you decrease immigration and you have fewer people coming in to take these lower paying jobs, that will push wages up. And it does, but it was so much so that we have a shortage of workers. But the bigger problem, I think, is a much bigger, more structural thing, right? I mean, there was a push recently, the so-called Fight for 15. I don't know if you remember that slogan about having a, a, a minimum wage at um, $15 an hour, which failed. And the counter argument was that you know, entry level positions are not meant to be careers. They're stepping stones for going up. 
However, there are a lot of people that have those jobs and they're working two of those jobs um, to, to make ends meet. They used to be jobs in the 50s and 60s where you could. I mean, there were people who worked at Sears or JC Penney's, and that was a job where you had benefits and you could raise a family from that. And in my personal opinion, that's also connected to things like the cost of daycare, right? I mean, if you, the cost of daycare, I remember when our children, many, you know, 17, 18 years ago, were in daycare, we calculated the, what we were paying. And my wife and I are both professors, so we had a lot of flexibility, and we did not put our children in daycare from 7 o'clock in the morning until 7 o'clock at night, which some people had to do. And I respect the fact that they had to do that in order to work. We didn't, but still the cost was the same as tuition at UW-Green Bay Whoa. at daycare. So if you're working just to pay for daycare, you can't do it. So you have to get a second job. And if you get a second job, then you have to put your child in daycare for even longer to work that second job just to be able to pay that. Right? So this idea of, I mean, lots of little things, structural things like that, having subsidized, cheaper, or even free daycare, having paid maternity leave, a lot of those types of things can contribute. The library will close in 30 minutes. That's All right. services will end, <laughs> including checkout and other computer services. Thank you. So those types of things, I think, can make a big difference of trying to help um, people in situations like that and maybe eventually will increase the um, wages. Hey, professor, um, this is not a gotcha question, <laughs> but who is the president of the World Bank right now? Who is the president of the World Bank? That is a good question, and I don't know who it is right now. Do you know? No, you're the professor. <laughs> But it's a great point because we don't know who it is, but that person has a lot of influence in the world. I think about late 60s, early 70s, McNamara. I do know who it is, but go ahead. Okay. He was a president, correct? World Bank. McNamara? Yes. Oh, he was the president of the World Bank. Mm -hmm. And then one of the architects of the Iraq War was also president of the World Bank. And you call them dictators. To me, you have to choose people like that to be president of the World Bank? I didn't mean, um, so that was one of the criticisms of them. And, and I put it in quotation marks. Not that these people were dicta dictators themselves, but that people in other countries viewed them as dictators because they were imposing particular policies uh, on developing world nations for which they had no say and they had, were not elected these individuals. So viewing it in that sense, and I'll give you an example. In Argentina, there was, uh, Argentina has a lot of economic crises over the years and they had to get bailed out by the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. And there were conditions placed on it so that they wouldn't default. I mean, they did default. They weren't able to pay workers. They weren't able to pay government employers, which were teachers, professors, police, et cetera. The World Bank and the IMF said, OK, we're going to give you this money, but here are the conditions. You need to privatize this industry. You need to cut pensions of public sector employees. You need to do this, that, and the other. And they felt like we're in this situation where our economy is collapsing. There's inflation of, you know, 100% a week and prices going up that every, all of my savings is worthless. So here's this international institution which is going to help us, but the conditions that they are imposing on this bailout are you have to be more like the United States and run like a Western economy. So they viewed these people who were the directors of the IMF or the World Bank as types of financial dictators, not like a Saddam Hussein or a Stalin or somebody like that, only because they felt we didn't elect these people, but the only chance we have is to have a bailout from the IMF or the World Bank, but they then impose these conditions that we're not in agreement with. So the president is who? Is, Chris, is actually of the IMF, is uh, Christine Lagarde, I believe. And, and of the World Bank, I don't know. <laughs> But I can look it up. You can have great ideas, all the professors that are thinking about immigration and climate change. But if people mm -hmm. with authority don't want to listen, what can you do? Yep. Very true. Very true. 
All you can do is vote. Maybe vote somebody from different. Do you, does the U.S. Um, worry about the decrease in birth rate? Do I w worry about it here? Y yeah, I do. Um, and I think that, you know, people are living longer, which is wonderful. My mother, who I love dearly, is going to turn 92 this year. My father lived to be 90. Nobody in their family, nobody lived even near that. Her parents, both her father died when he was in his uh, late 50s, early 60s. My father's parents died in their 40s. My father lived to 90. And as we live to be older and older, we have to have money being paid into support systems for that population. And the only way you can do that is by having workers. And if our, if our demographics look like this, and many countries have this kind of a demographic, you've got two choices. People have more babies, or you have more immigration. Or you cut Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, which I think is ethically and morally wrong, right? Because there are other options to support people, and as any society, a democratic, free society, should support the older population who have contributed all their lives to society. That's my personal opinion for it. So I do think it's a problem. And either people need to have more children, but a lot of people, young people, look at it and say, I can't afford it, right? I can't afford to have a child. I mean, that's sad if a young person thinks I can't afford it because of daycare, because of this, that, and the other. I have to work two jobs. Rent keeps increasing. Then the only other way to do that is increased immigration, and that is a complicated and polarizing issue as well. And the infrastructure part of that bill was for child care. Yeah. Yeah. Was mm -hmm. Right. So infrastructure doesn't, doesn't only mean that we have better roads. It also is a huge influx into our economy, right? You have jobs, and you have those people then that are paying taxes, and that will bring increased tax base to places like Sheboygan when, I don't know how your roads here are in Green Bay. They could be a little bit better. We got some bridges that could be, need some repair, and everywhere around. Um, you know, high-speed train, I think, would be wonderful to get from Green Bay for Packers games, if nothing else. People coming up from Chicago and Milwaukee so they don't have to drive back after tailgating and it cuts down on traffic. It's better for the environment. It's good for the economy. I mean, there's so many things like that that help climate, help jobs, help the tax base. Um, so infrastructure can be huge. Thank you. Uh, you're well, thank you. That's a great question. One thing I noticed, uh, I happened to be in Tibet a few years ago, about three years ago, and there were, <laughs> the hotel I stayed in had colder toilets and showers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's global thing. It is, yeah. Uh, the other thing I uh, was thinking about when you mentioned daycare, during World War II, we did have, uh, Kaiser Industries had a wonderful daycare system. They had laundry services, meals that you could take home, 24-hour daycare. And it wasn't expensive. Mm -hmm. Why has that fallen that the industries can't do that now? I don't know that they can't. Um, it's a question of well, do they want to or where the priorities are in many cases um, for that. I think that will change now with many women that are unable to go to work because they have to be home with their children? I hope so. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I. My main area is, is German studies. So I teach uh, classes on, on Germany and the European Union. And there are a lot, of, a lot of countries in the European Union that have free daycare. They have in Germany, I tell my students this, and they're like, oh my gosh, and you guys will be even more shocked. By law, your first year on a full-time job, you're guaranteed by law six weeks of paid vacation. Right? If you have a child you are guaranteed six months of paid maternity leave that's paid in part by the employer, but also by the government, and also by the taxes and the, and the um, benefits that you're paying into. So it's, the responsibility is shared three, way, three ways. And you also have a right to take three years off of your job, unpaid, but that you're guaranteed to be able to return to that job after three years. Because the idea is the first three years of a baby's life are the most crucial for the development of that child, for the bonding with the parent, and the, the parent, and it could be either a woman or a man, 
Not many men take it, but it is parental leave, not maternity leave. So there are ways of doing that. The trade-off, of course, is you have to pay higher taxes. Right? I mean, a lot of people complain here about taxes. Our taxes are not that high in comparison to other countries. And there's also a question of what you get back out of it. But you know, the United States is a very individualistic country. So coming back to the three tensions, that first tension, free choice versus societal choice. I mean, look what happened with the Affordable Care Act, the so-called Obamacare. Right? There was a lot of opposition to an idea of universal health care so that everybody has health care. Right? I mean, why, I, how that got to be a controversial idea, I'm not really sure, but the basis of it was choice. I don't want the government telling me I have to have health care. Right? I mean, that was the basic argument. I don't want the government telling me that I have to get health care. And to make it work, there was a penalty. If you didn't get health care, you could get a financial penalty initially. That was then chipped away, and that part was taken out, and then you know, people thought, well, the mandate and so forth um, complicated legal issues there. But it comes down to this idea of individual choice versus societal choice. And the United States is, for better or for worse, there are many good things about it, but um, we're a very individualistic society that we don't like paying taxes, we don't like the government telling us what to do. But the flip side of that is there's a lot of things that we don't have. The social safety net that used to be in place to a greater degree, after FDR's The New Deal in the 1950s, have eroded. But at the same time, there has also been an increase overall in um, prosperity for certain sectors of the population. So I don't know if that answers your question. Will it come back? I hope so, um, because I think that it's, uh, you know, I, I worry about my children, the kids, kids, they're young adults that I teach at the university, when they're concerned about things like that, that I, I have to wait, I have to get a better job, I have to work for this many years before I can get married or have children because I can't afford it. You know? And I think it goes without saying for most people that they think, and the, there's positives about that too, but they both have to work, right? That greater equality, I mean, it could be the man, of course, there's absolutely no reason why a man cannot stay home and take care of the children and the woman being the primary bread worker, winner. But the reality is that two incomes are necessary then to, I think, to raise children, to pay for daycare, to pay for college, which is skyrocketed as well. You gave a good example of Germany, mm -hmm. good things. But Germany is not, not the United States. Nope. It's not even California. Which is still what fifth and sixth, seventh largest economy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't, I can't fathom. And people are moving out of California, and it's still that big and economically. Germany? No, California. Oh, California. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Germany is the fourth largest economy in the world, and if California were a country, it would be like the fifth or sixth. So, um, and it, there it becomes a little bit more complicated. But you're right, primarily because of housing costs uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area are astronomical. But that also has to do with the fact that all of the tech companies are there, have moved there, those people are paid a lot of money, and that drives prices up. So if California were a country, things would look different because it's not just a state where uh, you, know, you can move across the border into Nevada or, or Oregon or something like that. So the comparisons are a little, uh, and I'm not an economist, but, um, but there are people in Germany as well that don't like, or Holland or, or, or Denmark, that don't like paying a lot of taxes either. Right? I mean, it's not like everybody's happy and, um, with uh, the system, but there is a greater, it's more of a collectivist society, I would say, than an individualistic society. Is one better or worse than the other? It depends on your perspective, right? But there are trade-offs to both sides, I would say. And look at uh, countries that have natural resources, mm -hmm. like Norway, because it's all the oil. And yep, and as a result, Norway is not in the European Union, because they said, we have our own resources, gas and oil, in the North Sea, and they never joined the European Union. However, they are 
they have a very, very left-leaning government, despite that, but are much more self-sufficient than that. But you're right, countries that have natural resources can benefit. And one of the most important natural resources going forward is going to be water. Okay. And where is a quarter of the entire planet's fresh water? Right here. That's right. right. So this is a huge resource that everybody in, in California and Nevada and everybody else wants because we're sitting on the future Leo, oil. It's already yeah. The mm -hmm. They're shutting down um, water. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those are as a result of climate change as well, right? That winters are going to be, or storms are going to be stronger, hurricanes, drier summers with heat causing fires, et cetera. And, and again, this is something that really, coming back to the positives of globalization, have to be dealt with on a global scale as opposed to a national. I think that. It doesn't matter if it's too late. We have to do something. There are going to, I, we're not going back to, you know, these, cha we're going to have to adapt to these changes. We're going to have to build higher, I don't know how things are here on Lake Michigan, whether they're increasing the dikes along Lake Michigan. They did along the Bay of Green Bay that they've reinforced and, and built them up higher. So we're going to have to live with those. But we also, in my opinion, we shouldn't say it's too late because then we're giving up. And I don't think we should give up because we can, while it might be too late for some things, there are other things that we can lessen the impact if we move on from that. Getting towards the end? Yep. If water is so important and it is, it can't dissolve the oceans. I think that that will have to be. There are countries that are doing that. A lot of Middle East countries are working on that desalination um, technology to do exactly so that. Would that be more important? And Jeff Bezos putting somebody, I mean, isn't that more important? Just saying, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think we're going to have to um, wind up now. Um, Thank you for great questions and a great discussion. Thank you.